why did we organize this seminar and why did we think that you might be interested in it? Simple, precisely because you're not going to learn these lessons in management school. These are lessons that you need in your life, whatever you do, whether or not you complete your course, you drop out, because people who are twice, thrice, four times your age come to us week after week when we do these seminars to tell us how they've lost enormous sums of their savings by making mistakes. So I would suggest if you're looking at this talk, make a separation between what you're going to do in your careers, where you probably do a few things that your job requires, okay? And what you do in your life with your money. So let's start with this. Slide says risk, okay? I think all of you are students of finance? Yes. Everyone? Okay. So I don't know whether you're gonna feel good or bad looking at this, but do you know that post the global financial crisis, post 2008, there's been a lot of global research to find out why did people do the kind of really stupid things that they do, did in terms of investment? Why did they take a second mortgage on their homes, you know, assuming that prices are going to keep going up forever? Why did they trust people so blindly? And this is research that has been done for the first time ever, okay? Because until now, the dictum that people followed was caveat tempter, which is buyer beware. It is your job to read the fine print. As long as somebody selling you a financial product has 20 pages of tiny legalese attached over there, they are safe because you as an investor are supposed to read, understand, clarify, and then buy a financial product. Now for the first time, global research shows that ordinary people, I mean in all the evolution process of thousands of years from the time monkeys became humans, we still have not got mentally hardwired to understand financial products, okay? There are exceptions, there are geniuses, there are the maths PhDs who will win prizes for what they do and who will sit there on Wall Street and design products because they understand finance. But the average Joe on the street does not understand financial products. And this is something I keep telling women when they do seminars on financial literacy, don't worry, the guys who are handling your money probably know even less than you about how to balance budgets and how to manage fun money. So in a way it's good news that it requires extra effort. If we don't understand, we find it irritating to understand financial products and numbers, that is normal. It is not abnormal. And it is this lack of core understanding that you know, gets, Devashish likes to say, people's eyes glaze over when the numbers go beyond 100. It happens to most people and they make mistakes because when you don't understand something, you act knowledgeable and you sign on the dotted line. So somebody sells you something, you want to pretend that you've understood and you finally sign it. And the more legalese and the more jargon, the more easy it is. The second reason why we get fooled, because everybody you meet has a sales pitch, okay? Companies are out selling products. You're gonna be doing it after your two years. You're gonna be selling a service. You're gonna sell all kinds of FDs, bonds, whatever it is, you're pitching it at people, you're raising money, which means that your primary objective is a sales pitch to someone. You don't really care how good or bad the product is. While the person who's buying is you, if you are a saver, which means that it is you who have to decode it and decide is it good or bad for you. Media, same thing. Most of them are focused on advertising revenue. It's gone to the point where now they have no problems even planting articles, which you know, uh, eulogize products which may be actually bad for you, make really complex products and derivatives seem not only very simple but behave as though every ordinary person and the housewife next door is not only trading them but making millions of rupees on them so that each one who reads the story begins to think that am I the only duffer who's not, you know, becoming a karodpati in the market when the going is good. This is the kind of sales pitch that the media pitches to you. And everybody else with a sales target is actually pitching at you all the time, making it more and more difficult for you as an ordinary person to understand what is good or bad. So all this comes in the way. Then there are the products themselves, okay? Now, what happens with all of us is we tend to translate our experience of buying consumer goods. You buy a television, you buy a mixer, you buy a toaster, you plug it in, pop the bread, it sort of works, right? 
you buy a financial product, what happens? You want to buy that car, even that one will allow you to test drive, right? So you can actually go and demand it. You want to buy a mutual fund, what do you do? Can you test drive it? In fact, you're going to know one year later whether it was a good or a bad decision, because that's when the results begin to show. So you can't apply the same yardstick that you have for consumer goods to financial products, but we tend to do it. And this works in several ways. One is, we look at big brands, okay? I deliberately had a really fancy car rather than a nano over there, because you know that when you're paying for that, and you're paying in crores of rupees, it is going to have a lot more features and better performance than a little nano, right? Not so in the financial world. You can go to a Barclays, you can go to a HSBC. As a student, you land a job there, sure, it makes a great difference to you because your paycheck will be hugely different as compared to a nationalized bank or a cooperative bank or some financial firm. But on the delivery of your products, the bigger the name, they're just as likely to land you in a huge financial mess as the smallest of firms or nidhis or whatever you want. There is show me your name, tell me it hasn't been affected. UBS, AAA rated bank, Citibank, almost on the verge of collapse, had to be bailed out. Barclays, virtually driven out of India after the 2008 when they missold a whole bunch of products over here. So let's not go into it. You pay more, but you don't necessarily get better stuff. You have a better ambience when they go to their office, and that's why you pay more, but nothing else. So what is it that we tell people when they come here? The first thing we say is how to avoid losses. We all work very hard to earn money. You all are going to start doing that. How many of you have an education loan? Nobody? Very good. Which means that you go out into the marketplace, you're not going to start by you know paychecks being deducted every month right in the beginning. You are not paying EMIs. It's something that you will start doing. A lot of other students who come, especially people who go to the IIMs, start their careers with a huge chunk of their salary lopped off every month to pay back education loans. So we tell people that when you have loans to pay, whatever you earn, the big lesson is don't lose money. That should be your first criteria. Then, you know, earn something on it then make sure that that earning beats inflation. So it's all step by step. But if you lose what you have saved, it's a big chunk of principal gone. Devashish is going to do a lot more of that in the second session, and you will know why we make this so important. Coming back to the point I made, do you know that this is a research by Ultrascan Advanced Global Intelligence? It's an article we carried last month. It says smart people are easier to cheat than high achieving professionals, and they are the most likely to be defrauded. Sorry, that's got screwed up. Isn't that strange? The world's most successful scam is what they call an advance fee scam, which is somebody who lures you into paying money in advance. And the numbers are so huge that globally people have lost $82 billion to date. And just last year it was $12.7 billion. Sounds amazing, isn't it? But the numbers are as big as that. So nothing exemplifies it more than this story. This appeared in Mumbai Mirror, I think. It's a woman from Dadar. So we said clever people are easier to cheat. This is a doctor, okay, Dr. Usha Mehta. Uh, can you guys read it? Or shall I read out the salient parts? So she uh, ha met a bunch of people who told her that they have a chemical which can quadruple uh, currency. Okay, so they apply the chemical and you know put four pieces of plain paper on it and you have 4,000 rupee notes instead of one. And they demonstrated it with one note and she was convinced enough to take 25 lakhs of cash and go to Lonaula. Now why have I put, it th put this up? Because this is a true story and clever people do incredibly stupid things like that. And she went with those guys, then she realized that she's been taken for a ride and she went and complained to the police. Now, can anyone tell me what is wrong with this story? She complained to the police, they got caught. And you think it was the right thing to happen? Who do you think was wrong over here? The guys who tried to con her, this woman was an innocent victim, or both were wrong? What are your thoughts? Anyone has any answers? Woman was wrong. Who said that? Fantastic. Tell me why. Something of the story that happened. Or even if it's happening, they can't take it. 
Okay, stupid enough to believe. But that's just stupidity. Any other reason why she is wrong? Sorry? Okay, let's just suppose she believed that there are chemicals. I'm going to give you a hint. The police went, believed her, laid a trap and caught these guys. Now, you know, in my view, the police should have caught her rather than those guys or both of them. Anyone wants to tell me why do you think that, you know, she was equally responsible? She had that fear factor within her. And uh, uh, when they, uh, this four people came and she accepted that uh, offer for that, uh, actually, that was wrong because uh, she should have told this thing to the police that this four people came to me and this fraud. Was That's what she said. That's why she they got caught. Anyone else? Uh, one request, please use the mic because we are recording the session. Anyone else? No. Okay. You'd have won a prize if you're going to give me a correct answer. Want to make another attempt? <laughs> okay. Now the problem is that. It is completely illegal to do anything to reproduce currency, create currency. It is a jailable offense under the Indian Penal Code. Okay, So for this idiot to go and tell the police that four guys tried to defraud me, they should have actually arrested her first. Okay, Because any of you who goes and tells somebody that, you know, here's 10 rupees, double it for me, by putting a chemical, you yourself have to be caught first. Because nobody in this country has a right to go around duplicating or, you know, uh, triplicating currency. That is illegal and it's an offense in itself. So greed in this case, first, the cleverness factor, which you talked about. She's a doctor, she should have known better. Okay. Second, another point that you made. Since you are the first, I'm still going to give you a prize for it. Sir, I want to hand it over. So, second, woman, she should have had more brains than going to Lonaula with three guys. She's lucky that they didn't murder her for her 25 lakhs. Not, not him, not him, not him. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> He'll probably get one again. Uh, you there with the white collar. So, Woman, she should have had more brains. Four guys goes to Lonavla. They could have bumped her off and taken her 25 lakhs. For most people, it's big enough money. Even one lakh is reason enough most of the time to murder someone. Okay, So she's lucky that she was still alive. Third is it is illegal under the IPC. She has no business trying to run a, you know, instead of treating people to run a business of trying to quadruple her 1,000 rupee notes. The police should have arrested her first for even being willing to encourage this kind of business. But this is what greed does to you, that you forget everything, including the risk to your life when you land up over there with this kind of money with some strange people that you don't know. And your mind virtually shuts off. And this is the first thing that you need to guard against. And believe me, there are any number of doctors who attend our programs, and each one has tales of blunder. We had someone just two weeks ago who come, came and told us he lost 6.2 crores to somebody trading in the market. Okay, I mean, he's not bankrupt as yet, so obviously he earns a lot of money. But this is the rate at which you can lose money if you fall for greed. So we come back to the advanced fee scam, which is the biggest scam going in the world. What, what does this really mean? It can take many forms. It could be what is called the lottery scam, the job scam. I'm going to explain some of it because all of you are going to encounter this. Conferences, RBI, income tax returns. The scam, as I said, is growing at the rate of 5%. 800,000 people work on it. It's full industry. And more and more people in India, 870 million people were victims of this in the last year alone. Now, all of you, I don't know whether you use email and get this. Somebody in your mailbox will say that I've been stranded in Spain, France, Paris, went abroad, I've been mugged, my passport is lost. Can you send money to a Western Union account? Any of you have got these mails? No? Seriously? You have, right? Because I don't know of anyone who doesn't. It's a simple thing that compromises your address book. Uh, the simple solution is to change your password. People panic and you know dump their entire Hotmail or Gmail account and go and create a new one. All you need to do is change your password. But it's the simplest of these, uh, these scams. 
a Western Union account, if you don't call up the person, you're rushing there to donate some money. People donate as little as maybe $5, but for the scamster, it is $5 earned. Okay, so this is the most common scam. Apparently, gets a steady amount of money every other day. I have somebody I know in you know my friend circle who is sending a mail to this effect. So essentially, ignore them. The second set of emails people really fall for: Canadian lottery, Microsoft lottery, earned a million dollars, twenty-five million dollars, whatever. Some people say that, so what, I replied to find out what happens. Anyone has replied and found out what happens? No? Okay, good. But if you reply, something simple happens. That they will give you a lot of authentic sounding paperwork and they say that you will get the money. We need to pay some fee to get this transferred to your account. So that's where the advance fee comes from. And you pay that fee because you've got these millions of dollars dancing in front of your eyes, right? So you will pay your first 500, 1200, 2000 bucks, whatever, depending on the size of the scam. If you make that first payment, and all these scams have a standard pattern, the first amount is really small, okay? So if you pay that, they know that you're a sucker. They've got you. So then they start calling you, they take your number, and then they become more convincing. Some of them have connections with the diplomatic corps. They say things will come. The Nigerian scam especially is even connected with their diplomacy. And they will say, no, there's now some other problem, so pay a little more money. So you pay that. Sometimes you end up getting trapped so much. I know somebody who spent 35 lakhs. He was a consumer activist, okay? Because he got a mail. Let me come to this. This is a Nigerian scam, which usually means that it's some African dictator's widow who will be writing that mail to you, saying that her husband had say $25 million of ill-gotten wealth, which is stashed away in Nigeria, and she wants to use your bank account to root it out. Substitute African dictator's wife for anybody. These mails come even in the name of Raghuram Rajan. They used to come in the name of Subbarao till he was the RBI governor. Now they come in the name of Raghuram Rajan, who in his official email signature has a long thing at the bottom saying, we don't have an escrow account, we don't hold any money for anyone, because the mails are fairly authentic looking. They even clone the ID. They have the RBI logo. It's, I'm, I don't know whether you'll have received it or not, but you will sometime. I don't think anybody escapes it. Sometimes it's some guy from a Canadian mining company or an Australian mining company. Bottom line, they say upfront that it's usually ill-gotten, except income tax and RBI. Okay? RBI says that some global settlement is happening and some Indians have to get money and you are one of the lucky ones and they're going to transfer it to you on NEFT. Income tax says refunds. So you could be a student who has never had a PAN number and you will get an email saying that you know, you're going to get an income tax refund. But greed is such a factor that a lot of people jump up to say, Are, koi mujhe paisa de hai, why should I say no? So let me write to them and see. So if I'm going to get 12,000 rupees money for jam, why shouldn't I make a try? And this is the first place where you get caught you get trapped by your own greed so when you write to the african dictator's wife or amalinga raju's wife okay what are you saying you are essentially saying okay i know this is dirty money but as long as you're giving me a cut i'm happy to help you so they have got your mental frame of mind nicely figured out then they're looking at how much they can extract from you and it's a sorry state of affairs for us to say that so many people in India fall for it that these Nigerians have moved away from Nigeria, come to the suburbs of Bombay and there's so many of them sitting there that they call it a Nigeria Wadi. Doesn't say much about our national character, but that's why we have to spend so much time at our seminars explaining to people what this is. The second is a job scam. Okay, so you will get these mails that say, target students, so beware that all these companies, and I'm they, I've named these because each one of them has been a target, okay? So there are more that come, that they are offering you a job, that so-and-so has been commissioned to hold interviews. They're calling you for an interview at, say, Bangalore or wherever. It's not in your town. You, sorry? You got an email like this. Did you go? Did you, did you reply? Okay. <laughs> You're waiting to pass your management. 
<laughs> okay, so you get these mails, they ask you to pay upfront, they say that your airfare will be reimbursed and your cost of staying. So they're essentially trying to get, usually it's 10,000 bucks, they're telling you pay the money upfront because we'll return. The conference scam is similar. They invited for a conference on environment by say WHO or UNICEF, they always use large companies like this. A person who's doing the inviting says they've been authorized to invite people and organize the event. Nobody pauses to say, why me? I've done nothing on the environment. Why should I be invited to Paris for a conference? But they're happy to pay because the amount that you pay to register is as low as say $20, okay? So they're happy to pay that on the chance that you know, you're accepted and you'll get a free air ticket and stay in Paris and the scamster gets $20. This is sent to pe millions of people around the world. So millions into 20 is a lot of money, right? So they aim small, spread is vast, and victims are humongous. As I started with the numbers, so I don't need to sort of keep telling you. The RBI spends a lot of time and energy issuing ads to say, look, we don't do this, beware of it. Nobody believes it. I told you about a consumer activist who lost 35 lakhs of his money, life savings. More than that, he was removed as the head of a consumer organization and a lifetime worth of work in terms of reputation gone down the tube in about six months because of an African dictator's wife. Now we come to the next part, okay, which is a big mecca for all of you finance students. Anyone can recognize who these two are? Fantastic. Do you know that this is a third batch? I told you that he will get a prize here. <laughs> this is the third time that we're doing a seminar for students and people look blank. The rest of the people here are blank. So how do you know their names? You regularly. I don't fall for it. <laughs> anyway, I mean, I keep saying that it's out of sight, out of mind so fast that you must be watching for the last four years because I was personally shocked the first time I said, so do you recognize them? And batch of management students looked blank okay so we did a second seminar for second year management students and they looked blank again so happy to i mean you would be surprised what you thought everybody knows you would be surprised at how few people know okay so they were the rock stars in the entire five-year bull run that went up to 2008 after that forgotten because this is how the market moved the market moves like this, every fool is a genius, okay? So everyone's glued to CNBC, doesn't work, come to office, you have a smartphone, you're looking at stock quotations because you think that's where the big money is made. And it doesn't matter what happens here, the bigger losers are people like this. Any number of ads those days would say guaranteed returns, risk-free. Even today we are getting mails saying, you know, angel broking fooled me and India into Infoline fooled me because they went and gave their money. This is the market's moving like this. I'm giving you cash and you double it for me. Nobody in life doubles anyone's money, okay? They trade, they over trade, they trade in derivatives and they lose. And when they lose, the losses are yours. When they make money, they get a commission. So for them, it's a win-win situation. Market goes up, they're churning your stock, they're earning a commission. Market goes down, the losses are written in your books. So any number of people have lost huge amounts of money. National Spot Exchange, which you've been reading about these days, was another one like that. 14% return on a ready-forward transaction. Nobody bothered to say, was it legal? Were, were the commodities there? Were the, where, did the warehouses exist? Because you get 9% in a bank FD over three years, you're getting 14% here. So greed plays a role. We are, you know, there's a bunch of people from ITC who said 20 crores they lost. The broker has, I told you this doctor, he, another woman from Air India, life savings wiped out by one broker and the broker himself has lost money. So they went and filed a police complaint, but they get zero because he himself has nothing. More famous one was Stock Guru. This guy was like husband and wife, regular bunty and bubbly, kept changing names, disguises. But the minute you stand out there, in fact, we joke in Money Life that with, our, with a name like Money Life, instead of calling people for seminars, if we had told them that, you know, put your money and you get a 100% return, I think we would have had to hire a bigger hall. 
okay? Because you just have to give a lie and people are ready to fall for it rather than anything that requires hard work, analysis, study in order to earn a decent return. So these guys changed their names multiple times. How many of you have heard of this stock guru scam? Two years ago, nobody was reading business stories because these guys were caught less than two years ago. We first wrote about it in 2010 and for two more years after that they were scamming people and I think they were finally caught. They managed to raise over a thousand crore. Next, pyramid schemes, MLMs. How many of you have heard of pyramid schemes? What does it, anyone know what is a pyramid scheme? Correct. Yeah, so what happens? So you just uh, hire, you, you, you invite some people, you get them, you tell them that you'll be paid, say work from home or something, and then they hire more people. So once uh, people get connected under you, Correct. you form a chain. And then you get some uh, kind of uh, commission on that. Every time they do that. Perfect. Fantastic. So you get another price. Okay, so chain marketing scheme is that when every time you buy something or do something, if it requires you to get one or more person enrolled to form a chain or to form a pyramid, that's called a pyramid or chain marketing scheme. In India, these are completely illegal because you have something called the Price Chits and Money Circulation Act of 1978, which says that any scheme that requires one or more person to be hired, then it is illegal, okay, because it's called a money circulation scheme. Now, you would turn around and say, but there are hundreds of them. Amway is global, Herbalife is global. So why is it that, you, well, now you know that the Amway chairman is sitting in jail for the last two months. But the point is that they are allowed to survive because Mera Bharat Mahan, okay? Nothing that is illegal is necessarily caught when it ought to be caught. This itself was argued in court and there is a court judgment which says that just because the authorities have not gone after something because the person argued in court that well you know everybody is functioning so why am I being called illegal so the court ruled that you are illegal because essentially you are caught and someone has complained and there is a case and just because the authorities have not gone after something that's patently illegal doesn't make an illegal act legal okay so in spite of the court judgment Unfortunately, it applied only to that company, some Apple something, nothing to do with Steve Jobs, but this was a Kerala High Court judgment, which means everybody else merrily continues to function until the police in some state or the other decide to wake up and catch them. And the police in Hyderabad have been very active, which is why Ambe was caught in Hyderabad, There's something called Japan Life that was caught in Hyderabad. And the minute they, somebody forms a chain, Again, it's extremely easy because people start with friends, relatives, and since you're going to earn when they do something, everything is extra hyped up, and the amount of money raised is enormous, and I'm going to come up with numbers. Some of them have similar schemes. So you had the Sharda Chit Fund, where you would have read yesterday that they even questioned Aparna Sen. 23 people have committed suicide. The biggest names in West Bengal were involved, and this pretended to be a chit fund. All it did was target the poorest people and offer them significantly higher returns. It's so easy to lure people because we keep saying you have money in a bank deposit for a year, you get 9%, it doesn't beat inflation. And if somebody comes around and says, I'll give you 13%, 14%, 15%, you don't even have to say, I'll double your money, like some of these scams do. Many of the chain marketing scams, the binary ones, where you have to get only two people and left hand, they call it, the reason I'm spending so much of time on this is any time you go to a cafe coffee day or a barista, in some corner there is somebody hyping up something called QNET. That's why QNET is big and red. It is the hottest thing happening now. There are people who are idiotic enough to leave jobs in Infosys, in Wipro, in AC Nielsen and fall for this because they show them dreams of high returns. Amway, we have had their global public affairs person sitting here in our office and confessing that you cannot possibly earn more than pocket money with Amway, no matter what the hype is. This is the company itself telling us. But every distributor in the meetings that they have where they half hypnotize you will 
you know, do this group hypnosis to say that you will become a multimillionaire. And there are people who are leaving jobs, well-paid jobs in big companies to go and, you know, chase this stupid dream. Look at the numbers. Okay, I keep saying there's no uh, medicine for greed and gullibility. Pearls is something, Economic Times put this as a front page story. This company even went public. Herbalife is public ab abroad. Japan Life, 5,000 crores. This guy was connected to two prime ministers in India. QNet, again, huge connection with uh, P. Chidambaram's wife was their legal advisor. Some company called Agri Gold, which I hadn't even heard of, which I got to know from the Andhra police, collected 3,000 crore. Okay? Some of them fly below the radar. Speak Asia, we were the first to write about it. When we wrote and held seminars, people kept telling us that you're wrong, you're you know, unnecessarily maligning them. 1,300 crores gone. Even today, people are posting articles saying, my money is gone, how do I get it? It's too late, buddy. Emu scam. Has anyone heard about the Emu scam? Do you know what an emu is? Bird. So the story that they spread was that emu meat is better than chicken and that you can, you know, it's a huge bird, so every bird is worth maybe, you know, 20 chickens. And people were growing emu farms and they find that we discover now every newspaper in India has written a story on emu. Okay? Just go and Google and you'll see this. When I say media also plays a role in the hype, this is what I mean. And it was supposed to be the latest. I think Economic Times, you'll find stories saying how all restaurants are coming up with new recipes with emu meat. And now we know that emu meat is not even edible. Okay? And people have actually grown this, bought those eggs, and this was a pyramid scam that you get emu eggs and then you sort of you know, farm them and they're going to keep multiplying and then you're going to be rich as hell. Okay? So it's been closed down. There's some goat farming thing that's closed down by SEBI. Luckily, a lot of these are now now under SEBI regulation as you know collective investment schemes, but SEBI gets into the picture once they've collected 100 crore. And 100 crore, believe me, is a lot of money, okay? I mean, when I'm giving you these kind of numbers, you'll think 100 crores is small, but if it's your money, it's usually in lakhs or in tens of thousands, and you don't want to lose that either. This is a bunch of people who are fooled by a company called City Limousine. Now, this is the irony of what happens. There are 10,000 people here. And we keep saying, anytime we want to tell people to be safe with their money, you can't get 500 to come. And without even an advertisement in the paper, word of mouth is enough for them to come. They're sitting outside Azad Maidan police station to ask the police to help them. And what happens? 6,000 policemen, 200 income tax officers, 15 RBI officials, 300 from Mantrale. These are the kind of people who had invested in City Limousine. What was it offering? Something similar. You'll double your money in six months or you get your whole principal back in six months. So it's really double your money. And the guy actually paid this kind of return for three years. Now, who is this guy? He's the guy who made that movie Chakde India. Okay, so look at his reputation. He was all the time roaming around with two of our biggest film stars, Dilip Kumar and Shah Rukh Khan. Okay, but he's run away with the money. People are in court. And I keep saying there are two things to remember about this. That every scam which starts as a chain marketing scam actually wants important people and celebrities and people who you know, have public trust, like the policemen and the RBI guys, because they use their names in order to lure others. What happens when they get caught is that these people have the clout to manage to get their money out, usually. They're not doing it deliberately, but I keep telling people every time a scam is caught or a scam happens and a case is registered, it's each man for himself. So they are focused on getting their money back. We keep saying the stock guru was a thousand crore scam. The minute the guy is caught, it suddenly becomes 500 crores because 500 crores has been repaid for him to stay out of jail initially, for him to you know, probably get home food in jail, he's going to keep paying through his nose and he's going to pay it to this set of people because they have the power and the clout, not to you and me. So the suckers who don't ever get their money back, and I have no known record in India, thanks to the fact that cases go on for 20 years, of anybody who's got caught in a scam having got their money back, zero. Okay. In a nutshell, if it's too good to be true, it usually is. 
you've known all the binary scams is a one is to one amways you know first you have to have nine people those have to have six more than three so there are different patterns and again this is a global scam this is a uh, you know, chart that is on the FBI website. In America, all the regulators put it up on their website to warn people. In India, SEBI and RBI haven't got around to doing that as yet. But essentially, they're pointing out in just 10 layers, if you have a one is to one scam, you can literally cover the population of the earth. And so many countries ban them. We don't ban them as yet. So the reason I'm spending so much time is that you are exactly the target audience to fall for this. Speak Asia and QNIT. Majority of the people who are victims are people your age. Okay? Then there is something called phishing and wishing. This happens when you have bank accounts where people lure you to give out your password and your uh, date of birth. A combination of three things is your PIN, password and date of birth acts as your KYC. Okay, know your customer thing. Each one on its own is no secret. Okay, but you combine the three and people can get access to a, to your money in a bank. And there are various ways in which they fool you. Most of the time it's on email, which says that, you know, your account will be closed or we're doing some kind of review. If you don't, you know, click on this website and fill in details that your account will be closed. So most people panic. Older people lose money here more than youngsters because youngsters are supposed to be more net savvy and you see through these things while the older ones are fi find it difficult to distinguish between genuine mails and uh, scam mails. Some of them, when we say wishing, this is really a telephonic thing. I think you must have read just last week in a paper, somebody called up and they said it's a drive to check numbers and his ATM uh, account was virtually emptied because even today people fall for it because they act very authentic they use their best call center voice and say you'll get a call in advance saying that I'm going to call back and you know we're doing a drive so I'm calling let's just suppose I'm calling from Bank of Baroda and you know you'll get a call after half an hour if you're doing this drive so don't worry it's legitimate I'm calling you in advance to tell you to expect this call so the second call comes and you're mentally prepared to expect it so they said okay are you so and so is this your address can we verify will you put your pin and you, you you know blurt it out instead of using an IVR because you've been mentally they framed your mind to expect a call so they work in two stages and a lot again most of the people who fall for this are usually the 60 plus because they think this is all part of new technology and don't think it through and of course, identity theft, I'm sure, I, I'm not going to waste a lot of time, I'm sure all you youngsters are very familiar with what happens with identity theft, but it can have dangerous consequences, usually connected with your KYC, and it can be as simple as somebody taking a, you know, another SIM card in your name and running up a bill. Here is a woman who worked as a domestic help, whose nephew, who went and got the card for her, managed to use the same documents to get two SIM cards, ran up a bill of 52 lakhs and got his aunt arrested. Luckily, she was so clearly not the kind who would use it. The police believed her and said, who got it? And they gave the guy a third degree. And he confessed that, you know, he's the one who had called pawn sites, if you please, and run up that kind of a bill. So just money burnt, okay? I move to the third section. Anyone has any questions until now? Take a mic now so that it gets recorded. Uh, actually, I was not happy with the word that pyramid thing is not working because I know a teacher of mine. I was a young uh, five years old, no, within fifth standard. I had a tuition teacher in my building itself. She was then teaching us via tuitions and earning his livelihood. Now what happened ki after we all grew up, she didn't have students. So she went into this Tupperware thing, pyramid, same thing that is. Uh, she kept on doing this and now she is doing well. And she is even saying ki I earn more than what I used to earn. That is bound to happen because of inflation. But still she says ki I am earning better. So I was a bit like... Ki how These are just the kind of examples which make a fool out of people. 2% earn. And these are global statistics based on research. Okay, Tupperware is a global company. Amway is a global company. Go back, Google, 
and prove to yourself because you can do the homework yourself. I don't need to stand here and explain it to you. But 90% of the people who become Tupperware distributors shut it down. And the amount of money they pay, 90% of the people who become Amway distributors shut it down. Because what they do is that they call people into a room like this or on a tea party, they hype it up. It is part of their job profile to tell the whole world until the day before they give it up that they are doing wonderfully well because you look at the system it is about enrolling two or more people and if you don't sound very very euphoric and on a high about how well it is doing and how well you are doing you can't enroll one single person so if your teacher was sitting there and telling you oh it's so tough nobody wants to buy plastics what am I going to do will anyone get enrolled so unless she is going to say that I earn 40,000 rupees a month and I used to earn 10,000 on tuition, she's not going to be able to enroll anyone. So it doesn't matter what a person said. Look around you and you will know how many people were Tupperware distributors who have given it up. And we all started in the 90s not knowing what Amway is about. Even I, you know, was conned by somebody every journalist was i think there were eight of us in the times of india who became tupperware distributors we knew that we would never ever sell didn't have the capacity to sell one shampoo so we used up all the stuff that we had paid for at home and gave up the money and this is how amway makes maximum amount of money because people will use the plastic themselves whatever they have bought like we use the detergents and the shampoos and you forget about the rest and Again, this is globally proven data. You just go and look at pyramid scheme alerts and a whole bunch of, when I do a seminar on pyramid schemes, I give them all people the links where they can go and look, but you don't need all that. You are smart guys, go and Google, and you will see all the statistics there are to see. So get skeptical, and you have the biggest tool in your hands today, which is Google. Anytime you have any doubts or you think something is working wonderfully well also, Google and get the other side, right? Any other questions? I have a question on the similar issue uh, on the, about the pyramid thing. Uh, even I was kind of gone by the herbal life. Uh, but what I, like you mentioned, that they use all big names and all these people like I have seen Herbalife uses Virat Kohli and everyone for their ad advertisement or anything so when you say that there was one state which has already started looking or uh, taking actions against it then these things go on every week I mean I have True. seen that though I just uh, happened to do all those things for one month and then I understood and I left but then I have seen it goes on every week True. then why don't they take action against why it? don't they take action because this is India like I said they have very very powerful lobbies last week they came and bored us to death with a four hour presentation on how they are legitimate because they have something called the Indian Direct Sellers Association they use all their time and effort working with politicians with the new government in place they are like this likely to be a new law and I think we at Money Life have written the most about this so and we keep writing so they think that they need to convince us which is one of the reasons why the Indian Direct Sellers Association has come here three times the Amway public affairs guy who is an ex-veteran from the US Army and is in America has come here and met us. It is because they know that they are in trouble. They want a law which is convenient to them. And why is it that they can employ the Virat Kohli's? Because they have a product which is worth 100 bucks, which is sold for 1000. They use, they work very well through doctors. Herbalife yes. works through doctors as well as dietitians. Yes. Okay? And apparently they have a good product. Yes. But the product will be worth 200 bucks, which will be sold for 2000 bucks. Okay? And that's where the big money comes from and that's where the big con comes from. And the only time that you believe people and will blindly pay that money is when it comes from a doctor. So their big target, both for Amway and Herbalife, is doctors. Yes, okay? because they give the things, I mean, whatever is written on their product, yeah. they tell you can go and verify with your doctors as well. That is the kind of... But in fact, even that is untrue, because none. one of the questions that we have asked them in writing, and they haven't given us answers for the last six months is, are your products FDA approved? And show us the FDA approval, they don't show it. 
okay so we don't know whether they have steroids nobody has gone and checked today ayurvedic products homeopathic products which are bought without verification a lot of times have steroids right so we don't know and they admitted that they are not uh, fda cleared okay so we go next this is a small thing that i'm going to do most of you are just starting your careers doesn't apply to you too much but banking we say what you worry about on the flip side is banks because all of us put our money first in a bank and we kept keep telling people this is something that even you know senior journalists don't seem to know we had a big debate on twitter the other day and i was quite surprised at how many didn't know that cooperative banks fail every month there's an rbi press release almost every month about some cooperative bank being shut down while the large banks nationalized banks or sarkari banks you don't have to worry about private banks by and large if they are big private banks the government is under pressure not to allow them to fail so after the ketan parik scam even global trust bank was not allowed to fail it was merged with someone so we keep saying there's a safety in large banks only because they are large and it's like a borrower you know you borrow 1 crore or you borrow 50 lakhs the bank is after you you borrow 7000 crore like vijay malya you can still tweet happily and go and watch your cricket matches the bankers are worried not him so the same thing applies to banks the bigger the bank you know the systemic risk is so huge that it's the regulators and the government that worries so if you hear about a big bank that they're running out of money rush and withdraw from an atm you don't have to worry but if it's a cooperative bank that you put your money in then please do worry because only 1 lakh will be safe because it is insured and that too you will get after 2 years when the bank is fully under liquidation so small things that you need to know when you start your career next is relationship managers i'm not coming to that usually doesn't apply to you safety tips these days you have to ask a lot of questions anything that a banker promises you get it in writing because they don't hesitate to make all kinds of promises especially when they ask you to buy products that are linked to insurance or linked to any other sort of convenience which may or may not come or which gets charged afterwards so whether it is the smss that come to your phone that start as a free service but then end up getting charged what you worry about virat kohli amitabh bachchan sachin tendulkar it's the biggest tool for selling all kinds of products so if herbal life has you know sanya mirza and others banks have this so you have insurance is one of the most difficult areas for anyone to understand and to choose correctly and all three are insurance ads and we keep saying admire these people i'm a great fan of all three but don't listen to what they have to say when it comes to buying financial products it's something that we in money life foundation have been really lobbying hard about because we say that sebi does not allow celebrity advertising okay and we can't figure out why the reserve bank of india and the insurance regulator allow celebrity advertising we've been campaigning for them to stop it because people fall for it this guy is advertising a child insurance bharat ratna but a whole village that we know got child insurance not knowing how to get the money we discover that child insurance works well it's just trivia that i'm passing on because i'm not going to get into details on insurance 80% of the money goes into costs in the first 2 3 years and child insurance really works very well if the person who's taken the insurance in his child name actually dies horrible thing to say but it works if you you know die within 2 years of taking insurance otherwise it is a lose lose situation because if you survive then you know you get far lower returns than anything else that you would have done including putting money in a bank and getting 9% returns the returns are really low again insurance i'm i've been telling people that we have done some 30 cover stories on insurance so it can't be handled in a one hour session what you need to understand is insurance virtually works like the opposite of caveat tempter so it's not like buyer beware it is here the insurance company takes you in utmost good faith so they decide that anybody who is buying insurance is this nice honest upright guy who is filling his form with utmost honesty because they have nothing to worry about all they're doing is collecting your premium when you have a problem when you finally make a claim that's the time they take out their biggest magnifying glass and start looking at your form 
to see whether you fill your age correctly, you are dressed correctly, whether you have any past ailments that you have not reported. And maximum amount of rejections happen at that stage. So we tell people that insurance is such a dangerous area that please do not believe anybody who says don't worry about mistakes in your age, date of birth, any any part of the form. In fact, you have to fill it yourself because at the time you make a claim, it's liable to be rejected. Indians don't even waste time in getting insurance because we are one of the most underinsured countries. We believe that if that premium is paid and you are not able to make a claim, then that money is wasted. So we don't even understand the concept. In Money Life, we recommend that people need life insurance and people need accident insurance. And even though you all are students, I would advise accident insurance is one insurance you must try and get because it helps people who are spending money on you if anything goes wrong. Things can go wrong and it it is an accident insurance is about death as well as about permanent disability and in both cases it's worth having because the premium is small enough for it to be affordable for everybody so go back and think about it and try and get it i'm now going to the next part credit cards i don't think any too many of you have credit cards do you no but it's one area which people need to understand at your age do you need a credit card? Any answers? Okay. I'm not going to ask you. If you have not used a card, you don't know whether you need it. You obviously don't need it just now. Dad gives you pocket money. So to my mind, yes, you need a credit card because there are certain situations where nothing but a credit card helps. Okay, You've taken a flight somewhere. You're out of town. You know, these days, like Kingfisher left people stranded all over the country because their flights were just cancelled. Okay? Wasn't working. There's some emergency. You're stranded somewhere. You can't go to friends and neighbors to borrow money because there aren't any. So that time, the only thing that helps you is a credit card. We advise people that makes sense to have one. And the amount that you have is pretty small. Having said that, the credit card structure is such that it doesn't make sense for a company to give you a credit card because their fees don't even cover the cost of servicing you, which includes you know, giving you a nice card with uh, a number which can be swiped all over the place, the technology that backs it, and to give you your monthly statements, not covered by the fees that you pay. Okay? Why do they still chase people and give them credit cards? Because the structure is such that even your Dilbert says credit cards are the crack cocaine of the financial world. And this is why you need to understand how the system works. How many of you have seen this ad? Business class tickets for your parents' first international vacation? 110,000 rupees on your MasterCard. Renting a luxury car? 8,000 rupees. to the amusement park 5600 rupees watching your parents become children again priceless there are some things money can't buy for everything else there's mastercard beautiful isn't it so i'm not hawking mastercard i keep saying that imagine if the parents knew that that little idiot didn't have the money he was blowing up what he didn't have and he was going to pay through his nose. Now here's where the crack cocaine part comes, okay? So you have this beautiful picture, which is telling you every day bombarding you with the famous priceless series that you don't need to have money in your pocket as long as you have a MasterCard. Keep blowing it up, you can pay it afterwards. What they don't tell you is that the interest charges are between 40 to 65 percent. They claim 20, 28, 27, but this is part of an NCDRC case, that National Consumer Disputes Redressal Commission, and this is where they confess the rates are as high. The range is so big because, you know, nationalized banks have lower rates, foreign banks have higher rates, so that is the spread. If you roll over your credit, there is no free period. Essentially, when you spend on a credit card, you have a billing cycle. So maybe your bill comes six weeks later and you get to pay 
and you roll over the rest of the money. That's how the credit card works. Now, first of all, everybody thinks that the day they spend money, they have that six week billing cycle. It doesn't work like that because it depends on when in the billing cycle have you spent the money. So if you've spent the money day before your bill is due, then your bill comes the next day. So you don't have any free period at all, okay? The second thing is that once you roll over, you paid only 15%. And we've had a case coming here of some uh, of a girl who came for Disha counseling, who says that, but you know, I just went to Goa and I spent uh, on my air ticket. And then, yeah, okay, I celebrated my birthday. And then we came back and the next month I only bought two dresses. So I think it was just 12,000 bucks. And now they're asking me uh, one lakh plus. Okay, the reason why they're doing that is because other than the 15%, the rest of it carries this interest rate. Okay, now if you have rolled over your money and you've gone and spent again, then 100% of that is added and it carries between 40 to 65%, depending on where you, you know, which card you have and what kind of interest rate it carries. Which means that your money starts compounding at such a furious rate that if you, we keep saying that if you have rolled over your money, don't touch that credit card again until you've repaid it entirely. Even otherwise, you're going to pay a minimum of 40. But if you use it again, that's going to be added on and then the compounding happens even faster. So the reason why we have the priceless ads luring you is because that is the business model of credit cards. If you are the nice guys, you know, diligent ones who spend on a credit card because it's a necessity and on due date you paid your bill, paid it two, two days earlier, you are not the kind of users that credit card companies want or like because they don't make money on you. They want you to be like that young guy in the priceless ad who's going to blow up money that he does not have because then they have you nicely tied in for a year or two or more and in fact some people forever in fact in 2008 the maximum number of people who ended up even committing suicide or owning 10 and 15 cards because then you get into a vicious cycle where someone says okay take another credit card and use that money to pay back this one and then you you know run out of that cycle so you take a third credit card and you carry on by which time you have have three sets of things that are compounding and it is just way beyond you you know that's why crack cocaine okay and you you can't manage and you've seen these you know notice start noticing the newspaper stories because when it doesn't happen to you you sort of look at the headline and you know forget about it but there are gruesome stories about people who have killed themselves and they've been discovered with as many as 40 credit cards. I mean, you can turn around and say, how is it that the companies even issued them? Well, that is the job that people like us do. We have been fighting and fighting with the RBI to say that it is also the responsibility of the issuers to find out the financials of a person and not blindly issue them credit cards. And now working on a consumer charter, the RBI did not have even so much as a customer framework. And Raghuram Rajan said last week that they're going to have a consumer charter. And if you see the latest issue of Money Life, I've talked about what it's going to contain. We are still headed towards there. It's not happened. Right? So until then, it's each one for himself has to know how to be safe. So a few tips. Read the papers carefully because everything, every warning is there in the papers. Problem is 99% of the people don't notice it. This is an IRDA ad because there are fake calls to people saying that, you you know, I'm calling from the insurance regulator and you're supposed to get some money back and people fall for it. And they said, well, you know, your son has an insurance policy or somebody has. First, they get talking. They find out details. Then they use those details against people. And they say that you have money due on an insurance policy, but you will get it only if you pay some 5,000 rupees or 10,000 rupees. So it comes back to a variation of the advance fee the scam. And hundreds of people are being scammed like this every day, even as we speak. May not happen to you, but if you're aware of it, you can warn people. All this goes into what we call a credit history. So in the past, when people had a problem with anyone who lent them money, they could have a fight and forget about it. But 10 years ago, the government set up what is called Sybil Credit Information Bureau of India Limited to start tracking individual credit history. So when you borrow, even when you search for credit, so if you've applied for an auto loan and you've been rejected, even that data goes into uh, bodies like Sybil, Experian, Equifax. There used to be one more called Highmark. I think it's just been sold but it's around. 
So all these companies track your borrowing profile and based on that they create a credit record and in fact people like Sybil even have a credit score, Experian also has a credit score and that is going to dictate especially when you guys come into the borrowing market it's going to dictate whether you are entitled to credit, how much of credit can you get, at what rate can you get and worse if you are a defaulter you can be out of the credit market for seven years. So how is it tracked? They look at your payment histories. First of all if you borrowed any borrowing howsoever small if it gets reported to Sybil it is tracked. Second is the amount owed. So what is the size as compared to the salaries that you earn. Third is the length of credit history. There, in fact, the longer the credit history, the better it is. It's not a bad thing. So borrowing is not bad. Your ability to repay and your willingness to repay in time is what they're tracking. So they, the score depends. If you've been paying steadily for a long time, you have a five-year, you know, you have a 20-year housing loan and for five years you have an unblemished record of repayment, you will have a very high credit his, uh, score. If you have a new credit, the score will be lower for the similar loan because you're a new borrower. They still haven't checked out how it works. Then types of credit. So by and large, home loans, steady repayment gets a higher credit score. If you have a TV loan, you know, converted into three EMIs on a credit card or an auto loan, those are smaller loans. Defaults are higher. People don't ever default on a home loan. They're quite happy to, you know, ditch the borrower on smaller loans. So the type of credit also plays a role. All this adds up into what is called a credit score. It's a single three digit number. If you are a defaulter, this is where the problem comes. If you are a defaulter, in India, you're straight away out of the credit market for seven years. Okay, because so far, Indian companies have taken the stand. If you're a defaulter, we just don't lend to you. If you are in the US, you will have somebody who will come to you and say, okay, you are a defaulter, so your credit score is really low, but we will lend to you at, say, 21% instead of the normal credit rate of 14% uh, for a good borrower, 9%. So it can be as high as that, but you will at least have a lender. In India, you're just out of the market. And this is something that especially people who take student loans have to be aware. Defaults on student loans, education loans are huge, okay? Because students don't realize, and believe me, this is also uh, students from IIM who go abroad to study or IITs, they tend not to repay their education loan because they think that they're not going to be tracked. And if you look at the credit rating comp uh, credit information companies, each of them today is global, which means that they exist in several parts of the world. They can track you today even in America, and they can especially catch you when you come back. They're systematically catching people who come back to India because they've got a job or whatever even four and five years later something that you youngsters should be aware of because for small mistakes you can end up screwing your life at a time when you really need a home loan or you need a credit card you've landed a fantastic job and you want to go abroad you cannot possibly go abroad without a credit card as you know most companies insist on it these days and that's the time you will suddenly find that sorry no one is giving you anything so you have to be aware of what credit scores are and ensure that you have a clean credit record can things go wrong? Yes, things go wrong. The best of intentions with, you know, full intention of repaying everything. You can fall ill, you can lose your job. These are things that happen to people in a free market economy. And you just have to learn to deal with it. So one of the ways, there are these people like Disha Financial Counseling is a not-for-profit. They have a tie-up with us. We give free counseling to people. Abhay is started by Bank of India. You can talk to people. Basic lesson, don't run away from the lender because that starts a serious problem. Talk to them, resolve it, get a moratorium, get them to reduce the EMI, confess to them that you can't pay, figure out what you can do. There are lots of options that help you to be on track credit-wise. Key is not to run away. The biggest mistake that people make, I can't pay, I start running away. The banker calls me, I avoid taking the calls. I mean, I was in one of the Bank of Baroda meetings and I was surprised to hear of a film star. We all know I'm not going to you know, take his name because he's dead now. It's not fair. But even a guy like that was running away when they were trying to call him. And the minute you start running away, they have no option but to get tougher and to bring in the police. So whatever you do, don't run away from your creditor. Talk to people for help so that you have support. So 
In conclusion, safe investment is half the battle, prudent investment is the other half, insurance is a safety net, and I should add credit card is like cocaine but a necessity.